Welcome back. Hello everybody. Happy Friday. I hope your week has been great. I hope you've got great plans for Mother's Day weekend. Um, we appreciate you joining us every Friday for our Friday Figures of Faith um, and that you continue to tune in and, and just get a little bit of history from the Church of Acts to where we are today. If you're new here, um, welcome. We're pleased to have you on board. We encourage everybody to use the comment section if you have questions or you have additional information or um, an interesting little fact about whatever figure we're on that day, we'll respond to that. We encourage dialogue. Um, and what we do is we just kind of take a figure of faith from history and do a brief biography on that and how they impacted the church um, because we are very drastically different now than what you read in the book of Acts. And so that's just kind of the purpose of it. So if you enjoy history at all, um, if you've always had those kind of questions about how we got from there to here, um, if any of that sounds interesting to you, I encourage you to hit the like button, subscribe, and then go ahead and do the notification button. We upload every Friday, um, but it's at different times. So the notification button will help you know when we're up and ready. So today, last week we did um, a Chinese figure of faith with Watchman Nee. Today we're moving over into Germany with Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is pretty popular. Um, you can't really, it doesn't matter if you go into like a Christian bookstore or if you go like into a national chain like Barnes and Nobles or, or Joseph Beth. Um, every bookstore in the religion section is going to have books by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. They just are. Um, his writings impacted a great deal of Christian theology today. Uh, so um, his martyrdom and the life that he gave and served faithfully, regardless of situation, uh, is, is definitely one that deserves a pause, that deserves a moment to appreciate what he did, um, how he did it, and uh, how we're benefiting from his commitment and his faithfulness to the Lord. So he was born on February the 4th of 1906. Uh, he was born in Poland, but the place where he was born is now Germany. So right in there, uh, he was had a huge family. He had eight, there were eight of them, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer was actually a twin. He had a twin sister named Sabine, and they were the younger of the crew. Um, they were uh, six and seven of the eight kids. They were the sixth and seventh born of the eight kids. Um, but his, his father was a psychiatrist, he was a neuroscientist, he was really well known for um, criticizing a lot of Sigmund Freud's work um, and doing papers and studies and things to throw that off. Uh, his mother was also a teacher, she was also like an educator, she was a, a scholar of sorts. Um, so his whole family was brought up with education being important, they were brought up with strong work ethic, they were brought up um, in the church, they were brought up just kind of not necessarily accepting the status quo, but um, finding what they believed and supporting it with logic and reason and then pursuing that, defending that, whatever that may be. Um, all of his family did well in life and did well in different things. The oldest brother, who um, his name was Carl, he discovered, he and his partner discovered the spin isomers of hydrogen. Now that's like speaking Greek, but y'all might know what that is. They are credited for discovering that back in 1926. So like I said, the whole family's scholarly pursuit with education. His second oldest brother um, signed up for the war. He died in World War One, And there was there was a significant age gap between these eight kids. Cause like the second brother died in World War One. He was like 21 or 22. And at this time, the twins, Dietrich and Sabine, they were only like 12. So there's a little bit, you know, of stretching of years between child number one and child number eight. They weren't like back to back or within a year or two of one another. Uh, the third born, Klaus, was executed. Uh, he was executed because he was accused of being involved in a plot to kill Hitler. And so when the Nazis were in power, Klaus would be executed. Both of his older sisters married um, men that the Nazis would kill. Both of his old sisters also fell in love with men who were against the, the Nazi reach and regime and, and they were killed because of it. That's going to be a strong, obviously, um, theme, the opposing the Nazis as we get into Dietrich's life. But, um, just so you know, it's a strong theme because we're in World War II at this point, right? Um, Dietrich as a kid, like I said, education was important. He was raised with good ties to his family. There weren't really, um, he didn't have parents that were abusive or, or a life where he went without or where he did without or where he had to, you know, work for his supper or anything like that. He would get his master's degree from the Protestant Faculty of Theology 
And on December the 17th of 1927 at 21, he would get his doctorate in theology from the University of Berlin. So, and he would graduate cum sum laude. I mean, the, the, the Bonhoeffer family didn't do anything halfway. They were 100% and they did what they did and they did it well. And so you saw that in his studies as well. Now in 1924, at that time, you couldn't be ordained that young. That was too young. So he's completed his studies. He's gotten the doctorate. That's as good as you can get. You know, the only thing left is to be ordained. And so he's still too young for that. So he decides he's going to travel to the U.S. for postgraduate studies. Um, he's got like a teaching fellowship at New York Center, uh, at New York City's Union Seminary. So he decides he's going to go over to the States. He's going to um, learn a little bit more as in the fellowship. He's going to be able to impart some knowledge and get some postgraduate studies until he can be old enough to be ordained. So he sets off for the States. Uh, so on, uh, so, and that happens in 1930. He is quoted as saying when he got to the States that there was no theology here. He was disappointed in the lack of intellectual stimulation in the theological studies of the United States, that it wasn't deep, that it wasn't um, a, a lot of what he had experienced and what he had gone through. A lot of the things they wanted to teach or a lot of things they talked about, he already learned. That was part of getting his master's. That wasn't even the doctorate level of study. So he was kind of disappointed in this, this trip to the States that was supposed to be educationally illuminating. That kind of wasn't. <laughs> Kind of fell flat. Now, I believe this was the Lord working because while on the educational front, he didn't have a whole bunch contributed to his life and he didn't have a whole bunch that he could write home about, um, he did have some amazing experiences abroad. He did, um, coming to America, exposed him to things that would set the pace for his life. And had he not come to America, I wonder if he would have become the defender that he became. Uh, when he got here, of course, he, he made friends. He had good friends. He, he made strong friendships with, with men of the faith. In particular, a fellow seminary student, um, a man named Frank Fisher. Now, he was a black um, seminary student, and he was with the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem. And he invites Dietrich to go with him to church, and Dietrich does. He falls in love with the church. The church falls in love with him. He starts teaching some Sunday school classes. Um, but he just, he's, he's quoted as saying he just fell in love with the African American culture, that their spirituality, their passion for Jesus was like nothing he'd been exposed to before, that they didn't take a, um, common sense look to it. They didn't need a pastor to lead them into worship, that they just broke out into it spontaneously, that there truly was a move of something more than just a, uh, a mind or a thought process, um, he heard men preaching on social justices and he became sensitive to the oppressed, to minorities, to people who were treated less than, um, talked to as if they were less than just as a whole, anybody that, especially at that time, racial minorities, you know, was a big deal. And so he became sensitive that he, he had missed the boat on much of that until now. Um, it didn't apply to him. He wasn't uh, a racial minority. He wasn't poor. I mean, he wasn't super, super rich, but I mean, he didn't have to struggle for anything. And so that never really caught his attention. He was just really focused on studying and learning everything that he could learn. And when he gets to America and he sees our focus is on studying, of course, but it's, it's also on social justice. It's also on making people better people. Um, I can teach you and, and help you memorize every single word of the Bible, but if you don't apply it, it's useless. And so he was seeing that in America, there wasn't a huge push to know everything so much as it was to apply everything. You didn't have to be able to quote the scripture to know what the Bible said and act in a light fashion. And so um, he's quoted as saying his trip to America turned him from phraseology to reality. That he had read the Bible, that he knew of the Beatitudes. He knew that there was no slave or, or no free, that there was no Gentile, no Jew, you know, in the Bible. He knew those things and he, he wrote papers on those things. But he said until his foray into America and into this um, exposure, if you will, to this, to this oppression, that it was all just phrases. It was all just stuff you were taught. And it became real. Um, the, the Gentile term he actually had a face to go with that, right? It became personal because he met these people. He talked to these people. He teached these people. And so um, it, 
I think, I think that his trip to America, he thought was going to be an intellectual boom. And I think it was God opening up his heart and preparing him for his lifelong ministry. <coughs> Before he goes back to Germany, though, he would also learn to drive a car in America. Um, it said that he failed the driver's test three times. So he may have just, they gave it to him because they felt sorry for him at that point. <laughs> But it says he did learn to drive a car. It doesn't say he got a license. It says he learned to drive a car and he failed the test three times. So take that for whatever you want. But he was definitely open to trying new things, you know. Um, so he spent his time in America and it ended up being not what he expected at all, but exactly what he needed. And he knew that. He recognized that and he could see that. So he returns to Germany in 1931 to become a lecturer back at the cemetery, cemetery <laughs> back at the seminary where he had graduated from. Um, and, and at this point in his life, we see an active shift from a scholar to a man of faith, from absorbing all of the knowledge he can and reading all the stuff he can to physically helping people, to stepping out of his bubble and teaching everybody everything he could, everything he learned. It became important to impart what he learned to people instead of just keep learning and never really demonstrating it out. On November 15th in 1931, he did get ordained. He was ordained by the Old Prussian United St. Matthew Church in Berlin. Um, and so he's he's on the right track. He's going to be, you know, a minister, and he's got all the knowledge he needs. He's now making this heart connection, this spiritual connection to oppression. And he gets ordained, and things are just, you know, moving all right, right along like they should. But as we've discovered with all the figures that we've covered so far, nothing quite goes to plan. And at this point we see the Nazi regime arrive on the scene and it would derail his path. It would derail his plans. Um, some say for the better and some say not necessarily, uh, but that's where his life kind of makes a shift. Two days after Hitler becomes chancellor, uh, Dietrich does a radio address and the sole purpose is to denounce Hitler. The sole purpose is to say, this is evil um, there's even a point where he calls it a cult and he warns Christians to stay away from this cult because this Nazi mentality was invading and kind of creeping into the churches and, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer saw it. And so he was, you know, doing a strong warning. Hey, 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 this is not what you think. This is dangerous. Um, and so he took a very polarizing stance against Hitler and the Nationalist Party, right? Now, at some point, the radio broadcast gets cut off, um, did the Nazis cut it off? Was it a snafu? Was it techno you know, just technical difficulties? Who knows? But it gets cut off and it doesn't get completed. But it doesn't get cut off before it is public enough that people heard Dietrich Bonhoeffer taking on Hitler, right? All by himself. <laughs> um, and then in 1933, he calls all churches to be the voice of resistance. Um, again, it's starting to invade the churches. It's starting to look like to be safe, the, the churches, what they were doing was at this point, this is kind of early on, a lot of the churches in Germany, um, they weren't saying they agreed with the Nazi regime, but they weren't saying that they didn't. They were very much trying just to be silent and hold the line. Um, they knew the very real danger of coming out against Nazis, against Hitler. Um, they also knew they had a call, right? And so they, their thoughts were just, we'll just stay silent. We'll help where we can and let whatever happened happen. And so in April 33, um, Bonhoeffer says, that ain't enough. It's not enough. Um, he's quoted as saying, he is, a, he is not going to be a bandage to the victims under the wheel, but a spoke in the wheel itself. It's kind of like the saying that we have, we got to stop pulling people out of the river and start going upstream and figuring out why they fell in in the first place. He's saying, you can't just keep, fixing people that Hitler's killing. You can't keep uh, holding the griever's hand and providing casseroles. You have to stop those people from being murdered. You have to take a stand. You have to make a public statement about what you believe or what you believe is useless. You're just going to keep throwing good money after bad, essentially. And so he, he rises in 1933 and tells the churches, you know, get off the fence, essentially. Now, and in J July of 1933, Hitler illegally... Um, is aware that, and Dietrich's not alone. Um, he's not real popular, but there's a few other fellas that are, you know, with him championing, championing the cause. 
And so in July of 33, Hitler decides that he's going to have a new election and he's going to reappoint all of the key church leadership in Germany. They're going to have a new election because church leadership just needs to be redone. Well, that was illegal. That was against the Constitution in Germany. It's Hitler. He does what he wants. So he redid these elections. Um, and again, Bonhoeffer comes out publicly very strongly campaigning for people who weren't Nazis and who weren't Nazi supporters to have those roles. He campaigned for them. He encouraged others to, to campaign for them. He was like, if we're going to withhold any... Um, if we're going to be able to maintain any idea of holiness in the church, any idea of what Christ really wants us to be, it cannot be led by Hitler. Hitler is not the head of the church, right? And so he's doing everything he can. But as we all know, you know, uh, he's not successful. N not many people were against Hitler when he decided to start doing the things he was doing. And so um, the rigged elections pretty much give all the key positions in the churches to Nazi supporters or Nazis themselves. And the reason this is crucial at this time is even today when local smaller bodies of government, of communities, want to get the word out, they depend on the churches. They depend on the leadership to make sure the congregations know things. They depend on the leadership to calm the congregations. They depend on the leadership to um, help the community stay um, as one, stay in unity with one another. Um, and churches play a prominent role in helping the oppressed and feeding the hungry and, you know, with with substance abuse. There's a lot that churches do, and, and that's not different during Dietrich's time. So to have Nazis in these key positions, now from the head, what's being funneled to people is only what Hitler once funneled to people. Per perspection that goes to people is only what Hitler once fed to them. So if they see their Jewish neighbor shot and killed on the street, they know that's wrong. And then they go to church and their church leader says, um, you have no idea what that person did to deserve that. What you saw was they got shot, but you don't know that prior to that, that person hadn't come against this regime that, by the way, is going to give you a brand new house, that, by the way, is going to ensure that we're the strongest country in the whole world, that nobody's ever going to endanger your children. And they were able to spin it so that they could get the loyalty of these people to be a part of their spirituality. Um, and it was very much a poisonous um, seepage into the church. And, and Hitler was smart in doing it that way. Dietrich Bonhoeffer saw right through it and tried to stop it. It just wasn't enough. Um, after this happens, uh, Dietrich's offered a parish position to a place in East Berlin um, in 1933, and he refuses it, um, just saying, I'm not going to serve the Nationalist Party. You're not going to, I'm not going to come out against you and say what you're doing is evil, and then you rig it so that you get away with it, and then just shut me up. You think you're going to give me a posh spot. I'm not doing that. You know, you're not going to own me. You're not going to pay my paycheck. That's not what we're doing here. So he refuses it and instead takes a two-year appointment in, um, in London. And there were two German-speaking churches in London. So he takes a two-year appointment and ministers to both of those churches. Um, now, there were some of his contemporaries that said he was running away from the battle, that things were too hard, too tough. He had lost too many fights, and he was running away tail tucked. Uh, Bonhoeffer simply said, the truth is, um, there's no support. The churches don't believe me. The churches are not supporting me. You're not publicly supporting me. There's no party. There's nothing that is standing in the way of this regime taking over. And there's only so much one person can do. And if I need to go to London and recruit people, if I need to go to London and spend a little bit of time in the desert, if you will, to, to build support, to make connections that are necessary, then that's what I'm, I'm going to have to do. And so there were a lot of his contemporaries that said, yeah, he runs his mouth till he loses and then he tuck tails and runs. I mean, it was very um, controversial, him taking this, this role in London, whereas he saw it as it's either take this or work for them. And I'm, I'm not going to do that. You know, because nobody else is going to stand up against them. Now, the bishop who was officially in charge of the German Lutheran Foreign Affairs Office for Germany at the time warns Dietrich to abstain from any activity that is not authorized by Berlin. 
And the reason he does this is because a little bit before this time and throughout this time, um, he becomes one of the founders of the, um, what do they call it? The Confessing Church. And what they did was they were kind of trying to live out a New Testament church. It was based on the New Testament. Um, they had kind of eschewed the Old Testament. Um, and really focused in on the New Testament and what the New Testament said we should do and how we should behave and how we should act and what the church should look like. Um, and at this time, <coughs> what made him particularly a thorn in the side of Hitler is by this time, Hitler had all the major churches adopt the Aryan statement into their statements of faith. The um, confessing church would not do that. Uh, Dietrich said, that is not biblical, that is not what Jesus wants, and we're not going to do it. You can't make me, kind of thing. Um, and so, as he continues to London, and he's ministering to these couple of German-speaking churches in London, he's continuing with the Confessing Church. They're setting up seminaries in different places in Germany, and they're, they're training pastors, they're training students, anybody that wants to learn or be a part of it. They're training them, and they're helping them, and teaching them and those kinds of things. And so, um, of course, the regime gets word of it, and so they send news train warning him to stop it you know, quit growing this ministry because it was growing. It was, it was growing to the point that it was noticeable by the higher ups in Hitler's party, right? So it obviously was taking on some traction. And so they, they warned him to cut it out. Naturally, Dietrich says no. <laughs> He's going to continue to do that. So in 1935, he, return, he returns back to Germany. Um, and, and the idea is just to hit these seminaries and help train up these pastors, train up these students. Um, and when he does that, the Nazi opposition, it strengthens because again, we all know history and we know how it, you know, starts here and then explodes into what we see into World War II. Um, at this point, the opposition got so strong that the other people that helped, um, found the confessing church, the other people that were helping to publish his writings, the other people that were helping him travel, they were coming under flag. One guy was from Switzerland and the Nazis made him go home. Uh, another, there were like five or six that were arrested for just trumped up charges, just to shut them up and get them out of the public, just to break down the, the inner hierarchy of the church. They wanted to break down what was going on in the inside and they felt like, kind of like if you get rid of the head, the rest of it will just kind of fade away. And so they were actively at this point um, persecuting the confessing church leaders. In August of 1936, Dietrich um, lost his authorization to teach at the University of Berlin. They took away his teaching privileges. And um, then he was denounced by the state as a pacifist and an enemy of the state in, 19, in August of 1936. Um, he never stopped being vocal about what he believed. And what he believed was the Nazi regime was evil, that it was wicked, um, and that the oppression of minorities and racial minorities and the attack of any kind of race, the genocide that was happening right in front of their eyes, um, was appalling and should be stopped and <clears throat> he used obviously scripture to to support that and then he trained people to spot it before it was too late kind of thing he was trying to get them like i said before they were in trouble <clears throat> and unfortunately we know that doesn't quite happen for him but he's one of the guys you know standing in the gap trying to do the best he can do um so at this point now that he's a pacifist and considered an enemy of the state he has to go underground he continues with seminaries, he continues with cheat teaching, he continues doing all of that kind of stuff, but it's underground. It's not in the public. It is not <clears throat> advertised in the papers or anything of that nature because he knows it'll get shut down and he could get arrested. It could be done. So he's kind of doing his work and his mission as best he can underground at this time. Now, <clears throat> there was a very wealthy benefactor who came along and he provided his estate for refuge, for people that were students of the church, for members of the church, for their wives, for their families, um, those that were trying to get out of Berlin, that were trying to get out of Germany to a safer place or a safer, safer nation, um, a place where they could rest and be safe, still practice their faith, still be taught by Dietrich. Um, and so they, he, he's like, here's my state, use it as you need it. Super, super great guy. Um, at, at eventually, Dietrich would fall in love with this man's granddaughter, and he would propose to her. That happens a little bit later on, um, and, and when we get to it, I'll explain why that's, that was another little maybe not shouldn't have happened kind of thing. Um, but he does spend enough time there that he develops feelings for her, because he, he visits often at that estate as well, helping people. In August of 1937, the Nazi regime 
declares the confessing church illegal. The church, the whole church, all of it, everything they do, everything they say, all their activities, all their members, it's illegal. It's, it's not a um, authorized institution by Germany anymore. So in September of 1937, the Gestapo closed his seminary. Um, and by November, they arrested 27 pastors. They arrested students. They arrested former students, people that weren't even associated with it anymore. They just went like 10 years ago. If they found out, those people got arrested too. Anybody that was associated, it was very much a scare tactic. And they were trying to use it as a deterrent for any kind of future plans. Um, and at this point is when Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship, gets published. And it's convenient because in it, it, it is a, a deep study of the Sermon on the Mount, which is the Beatitudes. And Dietrich comes out about, um, he talks a lot about cheap grace. You know, the grace that allows you to look the other way and God still love you. You know, it's okay if you don't do anything, you're still loved by God. We all know it doesn't matter what we do, we're still loved by God, but that's not exactly what that's supposed to mean. And so he came out against that. And, and it was very much a preaching on... The Beatitudes in that the Jewish people need our help and they're loved by God and, you know, they're blessed by God. And it was also an opportunity to take those churches who had been silent and say, this isn't what grace is. You're cheapening grace by saying you can be quiet and God will love you anyway. That's not what it's supposed to be about. It's supposed to be an empowering thing, not a silencing thing. And so his book comes out at the perfect time for that. For the next two years, he kind of becomes a traveling preacher. It gets harder and harder to have set places where you could teach people, set places where you could train up others to go out into the field. And so he just starts traveling from village to village to village, uh, teaching and training and equipping people. And um, the villages and the counties and the, the, the places that supported him would also support the students and the pastors of what he was doing. And they would do that by employing them and housing them. Like those people would be the first people they would hire. Like if they needed extra help, they would seek out somebody who was a student of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If they had an extra room and a and Bonhoeffer student had come from another village to study because he was there for the next few days, they would offer them accommodation. And that's how they supported them. They didn't actually give them money necessarily, but they gave them better chances than other people maybe would have had for making a living and for making a life. Now, obviously, this eventually gets out. You know, you start making networks and people start talking. So in 1938, the Gestapo bans Dietrich Bonhoeffer from Berlin. He's not allowed to return to Berlin. He's banned. He's gone. And so again, they think his headquarters is probably somewhere there, not realizing he's literally just packing up and, you know, hitting him uh, one at a time. Uh, at the same time in 1938, his twin Sabine, her husband, their children, that family, was able to get out. Um, they were able to travel to England by way of Switzerland. So he didn't get executed. One of the very few of his family members that didn't get executed. Sabine and her husband made it to safety in 1938 as well. In 1940, the World War II broke out and the Gestapo put a stop to all seminaries and activities. Um, anything related to it, any talk of it, any, it was just, they stopped everything that would even be some, signify that it would be close to it. And then in June of 1939, the New York City Seminary that he went and visited earlier on before his ordination invited him to come to the U.S. for refuge. They're like, it's getting real over there. People are dying. Come here. Come be safe. Let us take care of you till all this blows over. And Dietrich does that. He's like, that's probably smart because his biggest fear was that he would be drafted. Because at that time, if you were a young man in Germany, you had to fight for the army. If they found out you weren't enlisted and they wanted you, you had to or you could die. That was a capital offense. And his biggest fear was they would draft him and he knew he would not serve in that army. He knew he would not become an SS. He wasn't going to do it. And so his thing was, I'm not done with my ministry here on earth. And if I tell them no, they'll kill me. And I'm not going to do it. So he was very much in a controversial place. He was worried about getting drafted. And so when New York comes calling and they're like, hey, come here, we'll take care of you. He does it. He's like, well, that gets me out of it because I won't be here to get drafted. So he goes um, in June of 1939. Now he only stays for two weeks and he goes right back to Germany. I saved a quote that I found when he explains why he went back. And so I'm just going to read the quote directly rather than give you a paraphrase or whatever. 
but he says, I have come to the conclusion that I made a mistake in coming to America. I must live through this difficult period in our national history with the people of Germany. I will have no right to participate in the reconstruction of Christian life in Germany after the war if I do not share the trials of this time with my people. Christians in Germany will have to face the terrible alternative of either willing the defeat of their nation in order that Christian civilization may survive or willing the victory of their nation and thereby destroying Christian civilization. I know which of these alternatives I must choose, but I cannot make that choice from a place of security. And that's why he says he goes back to Germany. It makes sense. Um, he realizes I can't ask people to stand up for the faith if I'm not willing to do it myself. So he kind of just jumps in both feet and goes back to Germany. He would serve as a courier for the German in intelligence agency. They had um, like a German intelligence agency, but there was like a branch that was anti-Hitler. So they were trying to overthrow it. They were trying to kind of ruin it from within. And so he kind of gets connected with that and he becomes a courier for them and, and delivering things. And through those connections, he gets protected from being drafted because they tell Hitler and them, they're going to have him come work for their office because he has all these connections abroad. And he did, he'd worked in London, he'd been to New York, he'd been to, and so they said he's more useful to us for these connections in these other nations than he would be for you on the front lines getting shot at. And so the regime agrees, because they don't know yet that this, this part of the intelligence is actually looking to overthrow him, you know, um, and they agree. So he doesn't have to get drafted, and he still gets to serve his purpose and help try to overthrow the, the Nazi regime. So he becomes a courier for them for a little bit. Um, he's also, and, and in that line of work, he was able to help, he was able to join forces and help German Jews escape Germany to Switzerland for safety during this time as well. He uh, is forbidden at this time to speak in public at all. Hitler, he's come back and they're just, they're not playing games. They're done. They're like, you can't say anything. I don't care if somebody asks you what the weather tomorrow is. You cannot speak in public. If you're, you know, in somebody's home, if you're privately out, so be it. But if you're in public, you shut your lip. You don't get to talk. And they even went to as far as, he had daily check-ins. He had to tell them what he was doing every day. Did you leave your house today? How many times did you go to the bathroom today? Did you have a visitor today? I mean, it was, he had to tell them everything that was going on in his life because they wanted to keep him under his thumb. They knew how explosive it could be if he was left unchecked. Um, and then in 1941, they figured out how he was continuing this ministry and this work because they had conveniently overlooked the fact they never banned him from publishing. So instead of preaching and teaching, he was just writing articles and mailing them off. <laughs> so once they realized that was happening, they were like, okay, you can't do that either. Just stop. Stop everything. And they banned him from that in 1941. Uh, it obviously is not a light subject. Obviously, it is not um, an easy life that Dietrich Bonhoeffer has to go through at this point. In April, um, on April 5th of 1943, he would be arrested. They would finally be done saying, stop doing this, stop doing that, check in here, arrest all your people, break down your fort, you build it back up. They just got tired of it, so they just arrested him. He was in prison for a year and a half. Now, at this point, three months prior to his arrest, is when he proposed to Maria. Remember the guy who gave him the refuge for people? So it was his granddaughter. And three months prior to being arrested, he proposes to Maria. This is a little difficult for people to stomach because Maria is 18 and he is 36. Maria was one of his students when she was 11. So people are thinking uncharitable thoughts about a relationship. But according to diaries of other people that were in the organization, according to the grandfather's diaries, according to Maria's diaries, he taught her when she was 11, a class, not just her, you know, other students. Outside of that, they never saw each other. They never talked to each other. It didn't occur until those later years um, when they started kind of serving the same cause together and they ran back into each other when she was 17. After she turns 18 in January of 1943, he proposes. They never do get married. But because they're engaged, she's the only person allowed to come see him in prison during that year and a half. So he's able to write letters, he's able to document things, and so is she. And when she passes, right before she passes years later, she permits them to publish her diaries and all of the works that she and he did during that time. And it helps build a timeline of what's going on. 
Um, so you can go find those and read those as well. He actually continues his religious outreach in prison. Nothing's going to stop him from telling people that Jesus loves them, that men are created equal, that life isn't supposed to be this way, that nobody's better, nobody's superior, God's not mad at anybody. You know, he continues this work even in prison. He just starts doing it to the fellow prisoners and the guards. It doesn't matter where Hitler puts him, he doesn't stop. He finds a way. If he can't speak, he writes. If he can't minister um, in a seminary, he visits town to town in homes. If he can't minister in the public, if he gets arrested, he does it in the prison. One way or the other, he's going to do what he's been led and called to do. Now, on July 20th of 1944, there would be a plot to, ki to kill Hitler that fails. Um, you can read about it. It's a historically known event of the war. Um, and there were a lot of different factions involved. Um, I think there were some well-intentioned factions, um, as well as just ones that wanted to steal the power of it all. Uh, but there were different people involved in the plot to kill Hitler. Hitler was convinced that Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a part of it. And so they transferred him to a high-security prison and charged him for that. How he could be a part of it while he's in prison, I don't know. But apparently, that was the thought. I think he was just looking for a reason. He needed a reason to be able to kill him. And so far, the offenses that Dietrich had done weren't killable offenses. And where he could kill normal people without question, if he killed this guy, he knew Dietrich had connections in other countries. And so Hitler was smart. He didn't want to create waves he wasn't ready for yet. Okay, so he had to have a reason better than what he had. And this was it. You know, so that's why I think he got um, convicted of it. In February of 1945, he would be moved to Buchenwald concentration camp. And he would stay there for several months before moved to another concentration camp. Um, at the, the other concentration camp on April 8th of 1945, they would start his trial. There would be no witnesses at his trial. There would be no cross-examination at his trial. And there would be no records to be found of his trial. So it was illegal. Basically, the legal team walked into the room and said, you tried to hit Hitler, kill Hitler on July the 20th, you're sentenced to death. And that's what happened. Um, and that happened uh, on April the 8th of 1945. The very next day at dawn, April the 9th, they hung him. They stripped him naked and made him walk to the execution yard, and they hung him with six others that were um, accused of being in the plot. Later in the month, toward the end of the month, I think the 28th, 27th, 28th of April, um, they would kill his brother-in-laws for being accused of being involved in the plot as well. They would execute them as well. Um, now, this is the official account that has been in history books, that has been in documentaries and whatever where you would find it for years. Um, but re more recently, there have been documents, there have been like diaries and things like that that have come to light that question the consistency of his execution um, simply because of who the story came from in the first place and timing consistencies. It's believed now that what happened happened, but that it wasn't he sat in a room and people came in and said, we're going to kill you tomorrow. And then at dawn, he was stripped and he was killed. They believe we're talking about a concentration camp. We're talking about somebody like Himmler, who we know enjoyed torture by all means. Um, and we're talking about a place without checks and balances for authority and a man that the Nazi regime had been after for over a decade that had just done everything they told him not to do and continued to that day to do what they told him not to do. And they had a golden opportunity to do all of the nasty, terrible things they were doing to people, to this guy. Um, and so it is believed now that, that his execution was a hanging. Um, there's documentation that says it took six hours to kill him. Um, you can ask any doctor, you can look at any documentary. It doesn't take six hours to die from hanging. Other things were going on. So um, it's, it's accepted that the clean whitewashed version is that he was sentenced to hanging and at dawn the next day, he was embarrassed by being naked and hung. Um, and it was probably a lot more brutal than that. And it probably lasted a whole lot longer than that. Um, but there was a fellow prisoner who watched him pray the night before and became a physician after the war and had said he had never seen someone accept death with, with such peaceful submission in his life, like what he saw um, Dietrich do. And, and I'm only, I can only imagine it must have been Jesus saying, forgive him, Lord, or in the garden, 
not my will, but yours. Just that quiet, it is what it is and you're going to have it. You know, your will be, your way is going to be handled with or without me being in it. I've done my part. You know, I've served you well. I've run my race. Um, and, and that would be the end of Dietrich and, and the work that he was doing. Now, his writings, you can, like I said, he's written a couple of books. There's all kinds of documentaries. There's all kinds of um, information on him that you can look up if you want to know more. Uh, he, he was the, he's credited as being one of the major influences for Martin Luther King and his, his books, his writings, his studies are the basis of the civil rights movement in America in later years. So um, he definitely, this German Christian, definitely had an impact on the church having a more prominent role in social issues. Of saying social justice is not a political issue. Women's rights is not a political issue. Um, you know, inequality is not a political issue. It is a Christian issue. It is a church issue. And the church needs to physically address it. We need to stop saying phraseology in that, oh yeah, that's wrong. And we need to be a spoke in the wheel and stop it from happening in the first place. Um, so his, his contribution was one that I think all churches to this day take as a call to action, you know? Man the stations, it's, it's boots on the ground time. You know, you know the word, now do it, kind of thing. Uh, he lived a life that was doggedly in pursuit of ministering to people and, and helping people feel the revelation that he got um, in America when he realized that the Bible wasn't just a book of words, that it was the breath of God. It was the Holy Spirit really trying to um, wrestle with our hearts, to make us better people, to make us better societies. Um, and and his, his impact carries on today for people who read his works and people who study his life and what he did. Um, we're blessed to have had somebody like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, especially in one of the darkest periods of time that we know of. I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, saying crusades or anything were great, but, you know, in our modern times, World War II and the Nazis, that's, that's the worst we've come across, you know, and that in that time, he suffered as much as anybody and, and it didn't waver. It didn't stop. Um, it's a real testament to that man's faith. Uh, I would that we would all stand so strong in the face of adver ad adversity. So, a little heavy today, but that's Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And like I said, we're into the 1950s. We're, we're getting closer. Um, I think we have five more, five or six more, and we will be wrapping up the Figures of the Faith series. So, thanks for joining us. I'm Pastor Joe Lauderdale with Living Grace, and we'll see you next Friday. Have a great weekend.